I'm Philip Liu. Uh, I'm the uh, CTO and co-founder of SignalFX. And here today, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit, a bit about uh, how analytics is basically used in uh, monitoring modern distributed applications. Um, so um, a bit of the agenda. Uh, so I'll go into a little bit about my background. And primarily, I want to talk a little bit of sort of the evolution of uh, uh, of the technology stack over the last 15 or 20 years and how I experienced that and how I see things change and what led to uh, um, uh, what we have today in terms of analytics uh, on top of microservices uh, for monitoring. Um, uh, I'll set, talk a little bit about microservices, uh, basically uh, uh, um, describe uh, what microservice is. Um, I know this is a kind of a fashion statement, but I, I think that's actually important for me to go into that because a lot of um, uh, signal effects itself uh, um, is built <coughs> using microservices technology um, uh, in the architecture, uh, and I sort of wanted to talk a little bit about that and some of the challenges in monitoring microservices in the, the, the monitoring, uh, uh, modern environments. Um, and then I want to sort of go into uh, 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 sort of the high level of what it means to use an analytic approach uh, to monitor uh, these modern architectures. Um, and then I'll follow up with an example. Uh, uh, literally, that's one of something that we experienced um, uh, prior to our launch <coughs> earlier this year and how we actually use signal effects um, to actually find the problem uh, that signal effects in production was experiencing. Uh, and then um, uh, close with a little bit of a demo about uh, our product. Right? Okay, uh, let's get going. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, so, um, uh, just sort of repeat a little bit. Uh, I am the co-founder and CTO of SignalFX. Uh, and um, in 2013, when we started the company, um, the sort of the 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 way people were building applications uh, is basically to uh, use SaaS whereas po wherever possible. Uh, and then uh, that kind of means that um, infrastructure as a service <coughs> is the foundation uh, where our applications run on. Uh, and that means that we have um, no um, uh, data center operations. We, have, we don't have network operations. Uh, uh, we, don't, we have very few system administrators uh, within our company. Uh, and then we build our services on top of infrastructure service using microservices. I'll go into a little bit about, about that. Um, uh, in detail. Uh, and then uh, and also we monitor our microservices that runs on uh, Amazon AWS um, uh, using our data analytical techniques, which I'll expand on later on in this talk. <coughs> uh, prior to um, uh, uh, SignalFX, and actually a lot of um, uh, the experiences um, that inspired us to start SignalFX um, uh, uh, was uh, born from our, uh, my time at Facebook. Uh, so I was there along with um, a few of our initial uh, founding engineers um, uh, at Facebook for about four or five years. Uh, and then um, the way I think that some of it to help uh, what I'm about to talk about in the rest of the talk is uh, sort of the evolution of how monitoring actually changed rapidly within Facebook itself. Uh, when I joined Facebook in 2008, you know, we had like uh, low teens, uh, thousands of servers, um, and then we were using open source technology to monitor um, uh, Facebook at the time. Uh, and so then, uh, non surprising, so uh, Ganglia, uh, uh, Nagios uh, were basically some of the foundational systems that we used. Um, and then even at that time, you know, Facebook is very, very big on um, uh, contributing to open source and making open source work at scale. Uh, and then even at that time, we could barely make Nagios work at scale. You know, primarily, you know, some of the configuration challenges that we had, which is very, very great. Um, so. Um, uh, we then embarked on, so if we can't use these open source uh, 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 polling sort of techniques uh, to monitor the uh, infrastructure of Facebook, what can we do? Um, we sort of then decided that, well, you know, let's use sort of data, data uh, analytics techniques, like right? basically collect massive amount of time series data into a centralized data store, uh, and then <coughs> provide uh, analytical tools on top of the data store um, to get insights into what's happening. Right? Obviously, there are a few key challenges here. One, actually, you have to have a data store that's able to um, uh, 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 consume a large volume of data uh, in near real time because uh, monitoring is a uh, in the end is a near real time type of system because you have to have uh, responses you know to your um, uh, uh, you have to have basically emit interesting signals um, to the um, uh, the end user of the system to let them know what's happening with production environments um, so that's one big challenge um, and 
uh, and then over time, we is basically spend quite a bit of time uh, building the system. Um, uh, um, uh, certainly, a lot of members of our teams did, uh, and uh, the system became um, sort of one of the most uh, used uh, uh, system within uh, Facebook itself, uh, and the sort of de facto way of uh, how Facebook monitors production uh, um, uh, uh, server. Uh, when I left um, Facebook uh, in late 2012, we were basically uh, at um, you know north of hundreds of thousands of servers at the time. And then the system um, that, uh, uh, that they, uh, uh, performed monitoring using data analytics was consuming uh, trillions of data points per day. Uh, and then we're able to actually uh, uh, perform um, uh, analytics on that and have responses within an order of minutes. So that's where the state of art back in 2012 at FB. Um, so you know, some of the questions that before we started uh, uh, signal effects, we kind of thought, well, you know, uh, maybe there are three companies in the world that have this type of scale, right? Well, other companies basically experience um, a, a scale to the point where um, uh, you have to use large-scale data analytical techniques to solve production problems. And then what we've basically found, you know, since the time we started uh, signal effects, is that um, uh, there's a proliferation of instances. Uh, mainly due to the fact that the, mainly due to the success of infrastructure as a service, so people are now all the most software companies, most SaaS com uh, companies, uh, when they spin up today, you know, by God, they don't think about a physical facility; they think about API to instantiate compute resources, uh, and then they build their applications um, uh, with um, uh, the knowledge um, and expectation that like compute resources are easy to come by and easy to basically shut off. Right, so um, that basically resulted in like a, a proliferation of, of instances like in the environment uh, and I'll go into a little bit about that um, so prior to uh, Facebook I spent a bit of time at um, uh, Opsquare um, and then so back then those days um, uh, you know, uh, Opsquare basically is a company that builds um, data center uh, uh, management software primarily in configuration space um, and I think that's one of the last um, <clears throat> remaining uh, uh, enterprise software companies actually doesn't exist anymore. It was purchased by Hewlett Packard back in 2008, but that was like that during this time, it's probably one of the last remaining enterprise uh, software companies uh, where it built um, a large scale configuration software for a um, uh, uh, variety of, uh, of servers and networking gear and storage gear uh, across many different OSs. Um, uh, and then like, during that period of time, you know, um, monitoring was still very much the open source stack that we see today. Uh, that we see actually uh, um, back about five years ago. Uh, and then uh, LoudCloud, which is a predecessor to uh, Opsware. Uh, I spent a bit of time there. Um, and then uh, back in uh, this right around middle of the uh, dot-com era, um, uh, you know the the stack was, you know, in, in those days, everybody had to stand up their facility. They have to buy racks of, of servers, uh, like lay out the, uh, the rack configuration, uh, and then the type of tools you use to monitor that type of environment and the type of expertise you have was somewhat different uh, from the day. Um, and then before that, I spent a little bit of time uh, at, at Marimba, uh, desktop management. Okay, so um, let's switch focus and talk a little bit about uh, microservices. Mm. Um, I particularly like this definition. Actually, there are many, def uh, many definitions that def um, uh, out there floating around. Um, so this is a definition uh, that Adrian Cockcroft, uh, um, who is currently at Battery Ventures, previously spent quite a bit of time at uh, Netflix. Um, and so loosely coupled service oriented architecture with bounded context. I like this because um, uh, is uh, sort of the loosely coupled aspect um, uh, uh, um, means that you know um, it is a service oriented architecture. Basically, people have been used to creating applications using that uh, 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 that technique for many many years. And you build services that has a uh, some type of uh, wire API, uh, and then loosely coupled basically just means that um, the independence the service themselves are deploy independent of one another, right? So uh, therefore, they're loosely coupled. So you don't have to shut your entire fleet of services down in order to upgrade. Instead, you upgrade one at a time, right? Um, and then uh, with bounded context, it just means that services doesn't know anything about the entire ecosystem. They only know about uh, dependent services. So this way that um, when applications are built, you know, they're built for a specific purpose, uh, and then they will do a specific thing uh, uh, very well uh, without knowledge actually how they're being used, um, and then with limited uh, dependency downstream. Right. So 
Uh, as an example uh, of this, um, signal effects itself, as I said earlier, um, is a microservice uh, environment. Um, and then, so signal effects, I won't go into um, uh, the details, but signal effects itself uh, consists of uh, 15 microservices. Uh, each one of the box that I have on the screen. Um, in addition to, like, the, these are logical boxes that perform a set of functionality. In addition to the, um, uh, to the set of functionality they behave, there are also multiple um, logical survey instances that uh, provide the service. Right? So, for example, the ingest API service, uh, we actually have uh, dozens of them running across multiple availability zones uh, on AWS East. Um, uh, and then similarly, like Kafka, Zookeeper, um, uh, and these are all things that we have, like uh, uh, many different, you know, Kafka uh, and Zookeeper both operate their own clusters, uh, and, uh, and the clusters have redundancy, uh, and then uh, replication um, uh, of, uh, of data between those redundant instances. Um, uh, and then so in addition to um, the dependencies of the services amongst themselves, um, there we also have external dependencies. So some of our uh, of services make calls out to, um, for example, um, uh, Slack, uh, 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 part of the signal effects integration. If an alert is to uh, occur, uh, signal effects will make an API call out to Slack. So not only do we have dependencies um, uh, of services within, on the uh, upper right-hand side, amongst our internal services, we also have dependencies uh, of services downstream. So um, it's a very, very complex environment. Uh, in the past, um, uh, 10 years ago, uh, the applications will not scale as well as what we have up here, but then they will, they're actually usually built in one large monolithic application server you deliver all at once. Uh, these days, they are decomposed into multiple smaller services and then deploy independently uh, in a higher scale. So um, given that, um, there's actually quite a bit of challenges like, in maintaining these type of services. Um, uh, one of the things is um, uh, uh, high iteration rates. So um, once you have smaller services, that means that, um, uh, so if you think in context of a small service, you're building a uh, small number of functions, right? Some of them are stateless, some of them are stateful. But because you're operating, because the logic set is smaller, uh, when things go wrong, you tend to uh, 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 fail fast, make a change, and then redeploy. And then so things basically iterate very, very often in this environment. Now, uh, imagine that's the case for every one of the 15 services that I have up there. So, so it's eventually you end up with an environment of almost constant change, right? Something's <coughs> always changing right, in this environment. Um, so that's one challenge now. When something changed, no. <coughs> what do you, uh, 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 when something changed, how do you know um, uh, the downstream effect of a service? The service itself may be running fine. How do you know whether the client uh, might have made some assumption about how your service behaved? You know, uh, is something, uh, did something change as a result? Right? How do you check, check all the possible combinations right, uh, of uh, how your services uh, are talking to one another? Um, uh, now, kind of related to that integration test um, is you know, intractable. So uh, if things are constantly changing um, in your APIs, even with small number of API sets, the version tree uh, becomes extremely large. So uh, that's another area of, of, of uh, uh, a dimension that sort of expands um, the a set of things that you have to test. So you, you essentially, because the combinations are so large, there's so many things you have to check, um, you can't ch possibly check them all in a highly iterative environment. So you decide, you know, you sort of narrow down um, the, the set of tests that you um, uh, um, uh, you you, uh, you run, and then so therefore, you know, um, then you know, if you run an only limited set of tests, you know, again, that's another possibility where a problem may occur that you don't catch. Right. Um, uh, and then, you know, so uh, also the other thing is um, now you're in this iteration phase, you push something out, you didn't test it, something goes wrong, uh, what do you do, right? So um, if you're rolling out a thousand instances, uh, you find that, you know, within the first 50, uh, the service does not look right. Um, 
how do you know that the service is not looking right? You know, are you able to react fast enough to basically roll back uh, the service? Um, because you know, uh, pushing out the rest of the tier may mean that the entire uh, uh, application may go down. Right? So how do you react to, um, uh, to problems that you detect, uh, or how do you detect problems like during these rolling upgrades? Um, and then uh, it's just simply the need to identify side effects. Um, uh, so in this complicated service environment, um, a lot of times that when you uh, when a request comes into the service, um, uh, it's not clear whether the request uh, latency, you know, maybe might be a little bit higher than normal, whether that's a problem, indicative of a problem or not until sometimes it's too late, until that like a large population of requests start taking a lot longer than the standard deviation uh, where you normally experience. Uh, and then by that time, uh, usually the customers are noticing the problem. So how do you actually identify that but before it uh, becomes broadly noticeable? All right, that's yet another set of problem. Um, and then primarily, and the last thing is that you know you really want to like let customers know that things are going wrong before they occur. And then in these type of microservices type of environment, it's rarely, rarely do you actually get um, the blackout scenarios where the entire service goes down. Right? Most of the time, what you hear is that some pockets of customers may report problems. Uh, and then, so how do you basically de de detect the fact that uh, some pockets of the customer are detecting a problem, and why are they detecting a problem? Service. So these all like are, are very inherent challenges that we live with every day. Um, so uh, I think it helps uh, to sort of talk a little bit about the, the, the entire, you know, to, to solve this set of problems. So there's an entire eco set, uh, uh, ecosystem of um, uh, tools which are uh, uh, available are available out there. Um, and then they range from the um, APM application performance space uh, into the uh, uh, sort of operational intelligence and sort of a real time uh, 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 time series analysis space, uh, the sort of where signal effects itself stands, uh, and then sort of in the log space. So uh, I want to sort of make an uh, analogy of like if you imagine a microservice uh, as a very complicated um, uh, uh, a jumbo jet, right? So. Uh, in the APM space, um, like um, uh, when Boeing go and tests uh, the <coughs> engine, right? Uh, so essentially, um, uh, uh, the APM would be the tools that they use to verify that the engine is actually performing uh, within bounds. And then, um, uh, if it's not, right, the <coughs> tools will basically tell them actually where actually it's actually failing uh, or not performing uh, up to spec, right? So that's sort of where the sort of we see the APM space lie. Um, uh, and then on the right, uh, the log uh, space is sort of like th when a plane has crashed uh, and then the black box uh, is actually laying down somewhere in the ocean floor, uh, you basically, after the fact, sort of the post-mortem analysis about what went wrong, you basically go and grok the logs. Mostly because uh, log analysis in a microservices environment is not fast enough to be able to uh, uh, tell you what is happening uh, while um, uh, 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 errors actually <coughs> occurring. Um, and then sort of the real time um, uh, and then uh, uh, the sort of operational intelligence metrics and events uh, space that we're in is sort of equivalent to the um, um, uh, the flight computers in, in a sense right that's that's observing all the detailed information that pl plane is actually measuring during flight the wind speed the uh, the barometric pressure um, uh, cone, uh, uh, join that with the re weather report and the data that's being reported by other planes that flew through the area uh, and then so with that all the data taken into account you basically uh, uh, recommend a flight plan right for you and then so that's, and, and that system crunches massive amount of data uh, as uh, things are changing in the environment to basically inform you how, th how you should uh, basically uh, handle the plane and handle the flight. And I think that that's where, um, uh, uh, where our systems sort of reside. Uh, and then signal uh, using uh, data analytics uh, in real, near real time basically help you uh, figure out what is happening with your, uh, 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 this very complicated microservice uh, environment. Okay. Um, so I'm going to um, now switch focus a little bit and talk about um, uh, sort of a, um, uh, a theoretical approach, like about how we actually um, uh, use data analytics for monitoring. And I'll follow it up with an ex explicit example um, that uh, that we experienced as signal effects uh, prior to launch. Um, so. One of the first thing, obviously, you know, as I alluded to um, uh, with the um, uh, the jumbo jet uh, uh, example, that you know you need to measure, 
uh, in a case that uh, in a microservices environment, um, uh, we want to gather as much metrics information, raw metrics information, right? Not calculated metrics information uh, uh, from the, that's emitted from the source itself. Uh, and then, uh, so things like um, uh, like uh, network and server, uh, CPU, memory. Uh, um, uh, disk networks. So these are basically the very raw uh, uh, metric that's available um, uh, uh, on the application, uh, on the platform that your application is running on. Um, uh, now on the application side of things, so you want to measure um, uh, things which are uh, things like app can measure uh, uh, latency, uh, uh, um, uh, size of request queue in a given point in time, um, uh, the amount of time that you're um, you're spending uh, every single API call that, that's spending uh, in, in reaching Slack. Right, uh, from your application, um, and then to like um, uh, uh, more instrumented information about the um, um, the users itself. So, for example, who is making which class of user are making the set of calls, uh, and then at what rate. So, these are kind of interesting measures that you want to uh, submit. Um, so, all core basically measurements. Uh, you want to emit as much as possible. Uh, obviously, um, uh, you can't think of all the things you need to measure uh, at any given point in time. And so, we see this forming as iterative process. So, this goes back to the microservices type of environment where you have high iteration. Part of the reason why you iterate a service is that, hey, you found out something that's interesting, you didn't measure before, you should measure now. And then, add in the measurement, we push code. Right. <laughs> um, and then, all the stuff that you um, uh, uh, are measuring and collecting, you need to basically store uh, um, at high frequency. And then storage is not, um, uh, it's not necessary to actually tell you what's happening right now, but it's necessary to basically um, tell you over time that what you're seeing is it normal or abnormal, right? It's actually not clear uh, at time because like, hey, you know, if your call is taking uh, 200 milliseconds to respond, is that normal or is that abnormal? I don't know. So the only way you would know is actually if you look historically, what is the uh, response time right, uh, of that call? Um, and then, uh, yeah. You know, so once you have the measurements uh, emitted uh, and then you have it in storage, you want to use uh, analytical techniques to um, then tell you uh, to join all this data uh, at this perimeter form into meaningful signals that you could then act on. Right? So, uh, uh, so some simple example, um, uh, uh, this is sort of uh, scrubbed out data that um, um, that we uh, use internally. Uh, for example, uh, capacity um, in, uh, is, is sort of a theme here. Um, uh, uh, one of the key things that um, uh, as a service provider we need to do is decide um, at what point um, we need to uh, add more capacity into our service. So um, uh, we basically use like very simple uh, information that we collect, like amount of um, uh, a CPU, amount of uh, a RAM, an amount of disk, uh, local disk, where that matters, um, and then sum that up and then give us a, a, basic, a total number across the entire uh, tier, because you know, in the case that we have even distribution of, uh, of requests in storage, uh, that makes sense. Uh, and then that gives us a sort of a number, as an example, about what is a t total tier capacity, and then when do I have to worry about the capacity. Right, so that's one example how we want to uh, deal with analysis. Uh, and then uh, usually that, like, once you um, uh, spend the time to build up that analysis, the output of the analysis, the signal um, uh, uh, that, you, that the analysis is generating, you want to create a detector in case that it becomes um, uh, anomalistic. Right? So um, uh, is the total amount of capacity uh, by one of your services uh, exceeding some operational standard? Right? So uh, in our case, uh, signal effects um, have a policy that we run at uh, no more than 50% capacity capacity at all time for every one of our 50, uh, 15 uh, uh, microservices. So we have detectors set up for each one of the service that in case that it exceeds a 50% uh, for some duration of time, like let the, uh, at the, owning, uh, uh, the owner of the service know, uh, and then um, uh, the owner service can then act by adding more capacity. Uh, in some cases, well, for stateless services, uh, we actually have uh, triggers that set up to then uh, automatically add more nodes uh, into the tier. So. Um, okay, so given that, um, let's sort of walk into an uh, example. Um, 
uh, sort of before I go into the example, I think some context uh, on signal effects um, uh, is important. Uh, as I said earlier, we use an instant, we have a separate instance of signal effects uh, that we use to monitor our production instance of signal effects. Right? So, um, uh, interestingly, uh, early on, we actually tried to use the production instance signal effects to monitor itself. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that worked until one of our ingest components went down, and then uh, we were blind, and then, uh, so we found that that didn't work very well. Uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, we, we did that mostly because uh, of, you know, we were trying to, uh, we were engineers, we were trying to save costs, and we thought we were clever, but uh, that didn't work out very well. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, so uh, some of the ways that, like, I'm going to talk through sort of the, the four steps that I talked about earlier, uh, how that apply to us. Um, the way we measure uh, signal effects uh, is that uh, we have CollectD, um, which is an open source agent um, installed on all of our VM instances. And then that provides us um, uh, all the OS level um, uh, 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 metrics, so things like the, the CPU, network, and RAM um, that were available. Um, uh, we most of our applications are written in Java. Uh, all, all services are written in Java. Java. Um, and then for those services, uh, we use Yammer uh, or Drop Wizard, a library to emit um, metrics. And so like, inside a lot of our code, you see things like uh, set up a timer for the amount of time it took this section of API to complete. Um, you see a lot of, um, uh, of things that says that the, um, the running uh, uh, queue size of a certain request queue or a certain downstream queue uh, a certain size, the, the, the active threads in, uh, in thread pools, uh, how many active thread threads are there uh, uh, out of the total uh, thread pool uh, allocated number of threads. Right? Um, uh, we also use a, we have also have a custom logger that we use that we embed into all of our uh, Java apps. Basically, a log appender uh, that counts the number of exceptions of uh, variance types uh, and then store those as a metric. Uh, that turned out to be extremely useful in a, um, an example I'm going to walk through. Um, uh, and then you know, all of this you know, data clearly you know, uh, we emit on a high frequency. Um, um, some some things we emit about five uh, once every five seconds, but a lot of the metrics I talked about earlier we emit every single second into the monitoring instance of signal effects. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, now since we have all this data uh, that's instrumented by every single one of our uh, uh, services and in, uh, in the teams, uh, each one of the, uh, the service owners uh, have created like multiple dashboards uh, that's inside of our monitoring instance. So when things do go wrong, um, uh, everybody will know where to go to look for um, uh, uh, signals about what have caused uh, um, the problem to occur. Right? So sort of a root cause analysis uh, we use that for. Uh, and then sort of finally, um, just as a reiterate that all of our teams uh, 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 deploy their services uh, on um, uh, their own cadence. Uh, uh, normally we try to deploy uh, on Thursdays, um, but um, a, lot of, a lot of times uh, services end up not having to deploy, so they deploy on Thursdays. Um, and then order, other times I, uh, we push out, uh, typically a new feature goes out, there's a lot of high iteration that goes on. We see a lot of minor bugs here and there, they end up pushing a lot frequently than uh, once a week. So a lot of push that goes out. <laughs> So that's sort of a little bit of background about how we operate our service the signal effects. So with that, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, a, a specific example. Um, uh, so to understand this, um, you have to sort of understand a little bit about how signal effects works. Uh, and then um, I'm going to walk through, uh, so this is basically uh, uh, the same diagram that I had up earlier describing that, hey, signal effects are, uh, uh, consists of 15 uh, microservices. Um, I'm going to sort of walk through some of the key uh, services which are involved uh, in this uh, example. Uh, so we have a, um, a, uh, a Java single page JavaScript uh, um, uh, user interface application um, uh, that um, uh, uh, essentially subscribes to a uh, stream of data points that's emitted by our analytics tier. Right? So, so the UI itself, within, in order to make that uh, subscription, the UI itself will um, first call our front end metadata service. Um, the metadata service will then create a subscription, serialize it, right, and store it uh, in Zookeeper. Uh, and then our analytics service will then be notified of the subscription of, uh, 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 of, of its output. Uh, and then when it, uh, when it generates output data points, it will emit those data points into Kafka. 
Um, and then um, the metadata API is a, that maintains sort of a state on this um, uh, uh, listener uh, uh, for the representing the UI. Well, then a listen for data points that's emitted by um, analytics into Kafka. We actually use Kafka uh, uh, quite a bit between our, our services for resiliency reasons. So in case any of our instances go down, Kafka basically will maintain the data points which are generated uh, with the last known state uh, of that stream. So then uh, the metadata API, once you receive the output um, of uh, Kafka, uh, uh, data points from analytics through Kafka, and then you miss that back to the user interface, and the user interface then render that uh, 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 to the end user. So I'll actually show you a demo of that in a bit. Uh, okay, so um, uh, in this example, we actually had um, uh, uh, the metadata. So we have an instance where um, the metadata API was pushed right, into production. And then the way we do pushes, um, uh, we do canary pushes. So we don't push. Uh, so we have um, uh, uh, dozens of metadata API instances. We don't push them all at once. So we push a canary into production. Um, so in this case, a canary is actually pushed into production, production, and sort of the part of our process is that we will then look at the dashboard um, belonging to the metadata uh, API team. Um, the meta, no, in this case, actually, it looked fine. Um, uh, so the canary seems to be okay, um, nothing to worry about. Um, however, um, uh, in the UI dashboard, you know, what part of the process is that, you know, the developer typically, hey, looks around, so my immediate users, you know, what are they experiencing in this case? Um, there were some, uh, uh, he found that one of the charts in the UI dashboard exhibited um, uh, some unusual number of timeouts, a subscription request timeouts that, that had happened. Um, and then, well, you know, is that normal? Is it abnormal? Uh, we don't think it was normal, so uh, did a little bit of more digging. Um, and then, uh, so one of the key things that we uh, uh, collect is a number of errors, right? So we did a little more digging, so hey, you know, is there some other signal that might tell me that whether something is really wrong or not? Uh, so we sort of looked at the uh, exception counts. By looking at a chart, chart of exception counts uh, for all the instances we're generating exception counts, it doesn't really tell you much, right? There are a lot of lines, you know, uh, there may be outlier, there may not be, the red line may be outlier, maybe it's not, maybe normal. Um, and then uh, what we did was then we sort of um, uh, uh, took a sum of all the uh, exceptions, right? So we used analytics to create a sum of all the exceptions uh, over that period of time, or actually as is happening. Um, uh, and then uh, compare that against what it was a week ago. And then this is relatively clear that, well, there seems to be a lot higher than it was a week ago. So something's probably not, uh, uh, something's probably wrong in this case. Um, and then we did a little further, you know, because we're looking at exception counts. Uh, we then looked at um, uh, the detail logs, uh, and then sure enough, uh, we found that um, there was basically um, a problem with um, uh, the serialized subscription object that was placed into the Kafka. Right, so, um, and this actually works against a newer version of uh, the downstream analytics service, but it didn't work against older versions of analytics service which had not updated the same library that would deserialize the object that, was been, that has been serialized uh, by the uh, metadata API. Can you go, Philip, can you go back a couple, a couple of slides? Yeah. So that one there, yeah, so those two graphs are obviously <coughs> deviating in, in, in that particular example, but they could be deviating only very slightly. Now, you could have added extra code into that microservice, which therefore increases the latency. So how do you, how do you determine that you haven't just put more code in there and changed the time that it takes for the API to respond versus there being a, you know, a difference in there? Yeah, th there could have been a lot of reasons. Uh, in this case, that because something else is happening, so we, you kind of want to, uh, this is one of the avenues that we sort of chase down, and then this might have, you're exactly right, could have been a lot of reasons why, but this could also be a reason why uh, it's causing a problem, just so that in this, we have to chase down other avenues as well. This is one of the avenues that landed us into a result. Okay, so I realize you're giving that as an example, but in general, if you've got lots of different scenarios that could occur, I would have thought you would want be t wanting to get your software to help you eliminate what those other issues might or might not be and help you narrow down on the thing it is because otherwise then you're still back to the idea of just sort of guesswork without having some sort of other 
helping guiding or, or pushing sort of direction from the from the software yeah absolutely so um, well first of all I think that um, uh, it's actually without this data so um, just imagine the additional places you have to go to get this data oh, that, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. that's number, that's number yeah. one I think that it reduces it gets uh, all the information closer to you so that you could then explore things a lot faster okay right? so that's that's basically one of the key things that we provide um, and yes that um, uh, uh, there are other techniques like that which we're working on around uh, correlation techniques that when at this point in time when something happened, these other anomalies had also happened, maybe a cost to help you therefore reduce even more time that to a uh, uh, fewer things that you have to explore. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the philosophy about how we do this, right? So we can never be perfect and that the machine itself will never basically find the core I wouldn't, I'm sorry. So machine may, but uh, unlikely, uh, yeah, but unlikely yet. may yeah. uh, find a problem for you. But the key thing is to reduce the, the places where you have to look, or, and also uh, make the place or the normal places you look, make the data summarize in such a way that uh, reduces the fan out uh, that you have to otherwise perform, and therefore reducing the amount of time right to finding your signal. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So. Um, okay. Um, and then, so let's sort of go into a little bit. Um, uh, and then, so that, so the, some of the things I, I we just talked about a little bit about key lessons is that um, uh, had we not had this um, historically, these type of problems are very, very difficult to find, right? So it's not obvious, like one one sliver of problem was introduced by one out of 24 nodes, right? So one twenty-fourth of the uh, responses exhibited the problem, but 23 out of 24 didn't. And it's important for us to catch it in this case is because that had we not catch this, uh, we rolled out the rest of the tiers, suddenly the, uh, uh, the percentage failure will rapidly rise, right, in our case. Um, uh, 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 and then, you know, again, so servers instrumentation basically help us you know, uh, reduce the uh, narrow down the root cause, right? In, uh, in a lot of cases. Um, uh, and then, like once we did this, we didn't have a detector in place, so we then created a detector to help us know that uh, uh, if the rate of exceptions um, uh, is to rise uh, beyond like two standard deviations, uh, let us know. This is sort of a very safe uh, uh, detector in this case. Uh, so let us know about it. So, so that's sort of the, uh, the, the flow that we followed, right? And that's how we use signal effects itself uh, to, to solve monitoring problems. Um, some other uh, uh, examples. Um, that we ran into. Um, uh, oh, yeah, this one is actually particularly interesting. So um, uh, we, um, uh, through our beta phase, so we had uh, a version of the API um, uh, that um, our client used, uh, a lot of our customers or beta customers used to emit data points to signal effects. Um, uh, and then uh, we at some point basically made a, because we, had, we were still in beta mode, we made a, 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 an incompatible uh, change. We let all of our customers know, you know they're in beta phase, this is actually all fine. Um, uh, and then um, uh, we basically have metrics to know that, hey, you know, no one's actually using the old API anymore, so we shut it down. Um, and then uh, one of our customers uh, had a um, uh, chef recipe that reverted into the old version. Uh, and then they accidentally uh, changed their agent to an older version that accidentally then emitted um, API using the, uh, the old uh, uh, API. Uh, as a result, like, uh, what happened was suddenly we saw a big dip in the amount of data points they sent to us. Uh, and so like, that was another example that we use our system to catch. And then that only happened to one out of the many customers that we had. Um, uh, oh, um, uh, TSDB, um, we use uh, Cassandra uh, as a uh, storage engine to store um, many of our, one of many data stores that we use, but we use Cassandra <coughs> to store our time series data. Um, so we actually did a convert, uh, one of our engineers gave a talk about this uh, a few weeks ago, that um, we measure basically the, the various ways that uh, we can store data points in Cassandra uh, and, then sort of, uh, and then compare them and then figure out basically what was the most efficient way for us. And it turns out that instead of writing individual data points as they occur, uh, if you write blocks of data points, basically fewer writes uh, is a lot more efficient. We sort of use uh, signal effects uh, to measure and improve and validate that point. Um, and then um, 
uh, service capacity reports. So I mentioned earlier about um, signal effects itself uh, runs no more than 50% uh, capacity in a given point in time. Uh, we actually use signal effects basically to generate the capacity reports. You know, the capacity formula uh, is specific to individual um, uh, uh, service that we have, but is given relative to the application metric of the that we that's important to us, which is data points per second that's emitted into signal effects. So um, uh, as you grow the number of data points per second, um, uh, uh, we actually will know basically the amount of capacity that grows, uh, that correspondingly grows with each one of the 15 services. Okay. Any questions before I go to the demo? Okay. Uh, demo, let me sort of switch over a little bit. Um, Everyone pray to the demo god. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, is this okay? Ah, good. Um, so, um, uh, I was talking about dashboards earlier, so uh, this is a demo dashboard, not a real dashboard. Uh, although it's using um, uh, some subset of production data that emitted by uh, signal effects. Um, and so, uh, the chart here, um, I'm going to start out uh, uh, looks going through these. Um, so this is a, uh, this dashboard basically built up live um, um, by one of our um, uh, uh, SEs. Uh, and so this one is, um, it's, it shows you um, the active UI sessions um, uh, versus you know, week over week uh, sort of UI sessions, uh, and uh, the I think the purple one is actually the current number, and then um, the orange uh, line is, is the week ago number. So there's a reason why you want to store um, uh, as we you know, get new data points in. We also want to compare compare to a week ago, and then the one line below here is sort of the delta uh, between the current uh, uh, and the week ago. Uh, and sort of actually, now this itself actually, you, know, you see this probably many different dashboards. That's where I want to show you how you actually use our system to build up such an um, uh, analytic. Uh, so first thing you'll notice that um, uh, beneath the chart, um, which is very, very similar to, it was well, exactly the same as what you saw in the dashboard, except it's stretched out. Um, um, you, you'll notice that how we describe each one of the plots right, in SignalFX. Um, the UI stream, <coughs> active streams, uh, this is a metric that's an application metric that's emitted by our application instance. Uh, and then so, since we have many different application instances running, there actually is a, and actually let me turn this off a bit. There are multiple uh, signals which are sent in. So one of the things that we could do is um, uh, create a sum, in this case that we summed over, <coughs> how many of this if I take out the sum? Uh, we actually summed over 2,365 2, time series. Uh, and that's actually done in real time. Uh, actually, let me uh, put that back. Um, navigation. Goodbye. Uh, what are you doing? <coughs> this is function as a service. <laughs> this is function as a service, yeah. Huh? Math. Math. Math as a service, Math exactly. As a service. Yes. Yeah. On, a, on yes. a data stream. Exactly, on a data stream. Exactly. So this is actually being done live as data streams, uh, as these data points are being uh, reported from our production instance into our monitoring instance, we're actually doing this math live. Right? Uh, in addition to that, um, the, the system itself uh, is designed to be very interactive. So then uh, as I perform these tasks, I, I quickly um, uh, get hold of the results. So All remember- right, Was I the only slow one that just finally got that or? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, you made me lose my train of thought. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, um, like the A, uh, A is one of the plots that we uh, we basically are created, and then um, B is a plot basically is exactly the same. Um, a time, same time series as emitted, except that it's time shifted one week. Yeah. So the way we perform the math is that as new data points come in, we pull data points from, uh, from the same metric as a week ago and then perform that, uh, the, the, um, uh, plot the second line. Uh, and then the third thing we do is, um, uh, uh, this is a what we call a combined function. We then basically do math against the two plots that we just created. In this case, uh, you know, we take um, uh, the current one, uh, the current um, 
uh, uh, number of active UI sessions, uh, uh, subtract uh, the one from a week ago and see what the delta is. Right? And then we plot that as well as a third plot. Um, so uh, generally, um, uh, this is how um, uh, we deal with the time series that's you know, the massive amount of time series that's been uh, emitted into signal effects. Uh, and then we make it very easy uh, in an interactive manner to be able to perform math on it. So you could basically explore uh, uh, your data set. Uh, and then after you do this, you then save it into your dashboard uh, uh, for um, uh, future reference and ongoing uh, analysis for your service. Um, just sort of quickly, and I'll sort of break a little bit for questions. Um, and we also have uh, a notion of a catalog. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to go over here. Um, uh, uh, the catalog, um, the way data points are emitted into signal effects, um, in addition to sort of a, the triple of you know, what you're measuring you know, as a metric, uh, the value, such as CPU dot uh, um, uh, idle time, um, uh, the value, this, and, the, and then the timestamp. Right. In addition to these like three primitive uh, triples that you emit, uh, you can also optionally emit additional dimensions, what we call dimensions, uh, uh, on a data point. So this sort of gives you more context about what you're measuring. All right. So um, uh, one of the things um, that we add uh, from our um, uh, Collect D plugin um, is the host that it's running on. Uh, and then if it has if the Collect D have plugins that collect uh, information such as um, uh, from uh, from services such as uh, um, Elasticsearch or Docker or, or a large um, set of open source type of services um, that we support, uh, we will then also um, uh, uh, annotate that uh, as part of the data point. So the data point itself will have additional what we call dimension in this case service uh, that's emitted into signal effects. <coughs> all of the dimensions, <coughs> excuse me, all of the dimensions. Um, uh, which are emitted around data points are then searchable in the catalog. So essentially, you could say, hey, you know, look for all the hosts, um, look for all the services in this case, um, uh, and then we'll tell you all the related, uh, uh, all the instances of services which we know about. So in this case, that uh, we know about Elasticsearch. Uh, if you click on that, uh, part of our product basically have pre-built uh, integrations. We know something about Elasticsearch, and then we, you, when we detect the fact that you're emitting Elasticsearch metrics and signal effects, we'll automatically you know, show you the pre-built uh, analytics on Elasticsearch. Um, uh, and then uh, that sort of goes on. Uh, so and this is also the way where you can uh, find out the possible types of um, metrics that you have sent to the system. Uh, and then so there's a generally a way for you to look for uh, information that you emitted into signal effects. Um, out of the box, we also have um, a, a host integration. Uh, we mostly have, even though we're an analytic service, um, uh, we're also a monitoring service. And then one of the ways that people still think about the world is via host and containers, uh, just in a, in a, from operational sense, even though they're not physical hosts, they're logic hosts. Uh, so we actually bring that forth uh, uh, forward in our product so that people can then start from a host um, uh, and then drill into uh, various um, uh, information um, uh, that is uh, relevant. So in this case, that uh, you know, if you drill into the host, we give you a standard host uh, 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 analytics um, that <clears throat> that most people uh, would expect to have. Uh, in addition, you know, we tell you what process is running. Again, this goes back to the theme that um, uh, one of the common debugging use cases is, well, you know, the service is slow, and then we find an outlier, hey, let's take a look at what other processes are running on the box. So instead of you having SSH in to the box, you know, we provide that to you um, uh, uh, in our product. Okay. So there are many different things I can sort of go into. Um, we actually support a broad set of integrations. Um, so in addition to sort of inbound integrations that we pr uh, uh, support, we also have outbound integrations. Um, so mainly because, uh, mainly that if we, um, uh, if we detect a problem using our product, so we want to send notifications out. Uh, so outbound things would be like HipChat, PagerDuty, um, uh, Slack, email, webhooks, for example. Um, uh, uh, and then we support uh, default configuration uh, 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 policies, and we provide that out of the box for people who are using Chef uh, Puppet. Uh, and then uh, there's a snippet that, you could pr uh, that we provide you that you uh, insert into your policy, and then to, uh, to automatically install uh, a pre-built version of Collecti on your, on your VMs. 
Uh, and then these are various uh, technologies that we support out of the, uh, uh, that we collect information and have pre-built um, uh, analytics for. Um, uh, and, and also, the, uh, we're a big supporter of AWS, clearly, then uh, uh, we have quite a bit of AWS-related information as well. Okay, something, uh, I'm going to pause for questions. Yeah. Can I ask one really obvious question? <coughs> yes. <coughs> I might have just shown it there, or I might have been asleep, or I might not have been listening, whatever. Um, you very much talked about taking measurements from the applications and from software. But what about the underlying infrastructure that supports that? And in terms of, you know, if there's something that's outside of your control or jurisdiction or has a variability about it that you don't spot, how are you taking that sort of input as well? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, signal effects is a, um, uh, generally just open API, so a signal effect, we're a service that we consume data. And then all of the operations I showed you uh, up to now are operations based on the data that we receive. So, um, and we're very agnostic in how data gets into SignalFX. And so one of the things that um, uh, we're going to next uh, talk about is actually how iOS, um, basically, uh, uh, we have an integration built that pull iOS, uh, 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 I iOS XR uh, information into SignalFX. Um, so that's uh, one of the integration. In addition to these things that I talked about earlier, uh, 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 that I'm showing you on the screen right now, there are a slew of other things that I wish I've not yet showed you that, that that's in the, work, in the works. Okay. Uh, specifically, like uh, we actually want to um, have exactly to your point that we want to have like not only um, uh, information from the top down, right? We want, we want to be able to go as deep as possible for root cause analysis, right? Because uh, the reason I say that is obviously if you've changed something in one part of your infrastructure, that you know that code example where we said we do more co we do more work, we do more I/O, we do something different. You could be pushing things around, and you could actually have a lack of resource in another p position that pushes one thing up when another one goes down and it could be related to that for example so unless you know all the data uh, have all the data and you know all the details you're really struggling to know you, yeah you, you've only got you've, it's like looking with one uh, you know through one eye isn't it you know you lose a lot of the Exactly. The vision to know what you can see once you've um, you cut it down. Absolutely, right. So in some cases, basically, you can narrow down the problem on application layer. Some places where things are happening on a, on a physical layer, yeah. it's hard for you to detect. You also want the data in front of you. Absolutely. <coughs> yep. So, since you do real-time analytics, uh, are there any scaling limitations? Do you have a microphone, sir? Yeah. <coughs> So the question is that if you do uh, real-time analytics, are there uh, any limitations? Um, uh, yeah, I think that primarily is in the, uh, the network, the overall fan-out network bandwidth that's available uh, in, in our system. So um, one, one of the key uh, differentiators between us and uh, other uh, um, uh, monitoring uh, system is that we actually um, don't perform the analytics that you see that I showed you uh, against data at rest. We perform uh, analytics uh, against data which are flowing through our service, uh, and then so in that sense, in a, in a, again, so each one of our uh, the analytic instances in themselves are spread horizontally against uh, uh, across many different. Uh, um, um, uh, 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 cl network clusters, right? So then as, as, as much bandwidth that you could sort of scale out horizontally, so that's sort of our limit, right? In, into what we could, uh, what we could do. Um, and then there's also an issue of, uh, uh, of latency, that's that we actually deal with. Right? So for example, um, if you want to calculate CPU, 95th percentile of CPU that idle across a thousand servers, one of the thousands, you know, 90, 999 of the thousand servers are reporting timely data, like once every five seconds, but one is reporting an hour out. So, like, there's our, uh, what do you do? Do you wait an hour before you perform the, the 95th percentile, or you basically cut it off at some point, right? So, that's yet another interesting uh, uh, problem that we sort of deal with. So, and one of the questions hmm. you, you showed sort of last week's or the week before's growth or trend, yes. and, uh, and if that was a production environment, um, what would, how would you deal with the fact that you might have had growth in the environment over time, you might have had a spike of customers on a particular week or a day or yep. something, and it might not be related to code release or something else, yeah. how would you sort of handle that? Yeah, so I think that for growth, right, you were probably reporting on the metric for the number of nodes that you have um, over that period of time, and that would be one of the, the numbers that you would compare. Okay. Yeah, more <laughs> yeah, <one laughs> yes. yeah. 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 